Good afternoon and welcome to this In Conversation session from uh, DNAD. I'm James Cooper and today we're joined by three creative experts, Tosh Hall, Global CCO, Lisa Smith, the Executive Creative Director in New York, and Candice Juniper, the agency's Head of Brand Experience. Um, and I'm going to jump straight into some questions as we think about sort of the nature of design today. So I thought I'd start with a, a biggie. Uh, what do you guys think uh, makes brilliant work in design today? I think Lisa should tell us first. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes brilliant design? So I think, um, I mean, obviously having a really incredible idea at the heart of it is actually what drives uh, incredible design. But there is also obviously craft and execution and just thinking about that we live in uh, a living, breathing, moving world. So things aren't so static anymore and just like, how motion and sound can tell as much of the story as the visual, I think is probably, um, I always kind of looking more and more for a combination of those things that get, get me more excited. And I, I think a more breakthrough um, when you start to judge and look at work. Uh, I, I mean, lots of the things that uh, Lisa said, obviously kind of a, a big idea is obviously super helpful because it helps kind of uh, people understand what the hell's going on. But I think for me, um, the work that I gravitate towards the most and the work that I've kind of liked the most um, in the last kind of few years has always been kind of the work that's kind of really driving and influencing uh, culture, I'd say. So I think obviously things like kind of uh, social media, just kind of like digital media in general has kind of given a platform to lots more kind of voices than we'd, we'd ever kind of had pre uh, access to before. So I think it's wicked for me because you see kind of a much broader spectrum of design. I think kind of what we consider to be great design is kind of broadened um, as a result of that. Um, and it also gives you kind of a, a window and kind of access to kind of broader audiences. So I think work that kind of brings new people in um, and really kind of drives kind of culture, I think, is, is there. And also makes change, I think, Candice, wouldn't you agree? That when we've worked together on things, it's things that also really then have an impact on culture in a positive way. <laughs> like <Yes. laughs> like how, how design can actually change the world. In the, in a, I mean, that sounds like, <laughs> like possible, but in, in small ways, how it can make a difference. So then it's, it's more meaningful. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that we look for as well. It's changing like, minds and changing behavior, right? So that can change the world. Yeah. If you think about our industry at large, uh, I think DNA, DNA D is a good exemplar because of, I don't know if you guys still do this, but at the time it was, what's the idea? Is it crafted incredibly? And is it relevant to its context? Those are really good table stakes. And so that is a way of defining the quality of design at the international level. That is excellent. But what I think Candace and Lisa are talking about is the power of design, at least today, is even more prominent than it ever has been. And so our ability to actually change the value of brands, actually push culture forward, actually make people's lives better. Think about some of the work that has been in the past year, two, three, four, five. If you look back at annuals from 10, 20 years ago, maybe it's just beautiful design that has a clever idea. Today, I think it's incumbent upon us as creative people and agencies and brands, in fact, to make sure that what we do is not only, you know, having an excellent idea being beautifully crafted, because we are in the craft of making excellent work that is really, really beautiful at the table stakes, and it has to be relevant to its audience, its context, the world that we live in. But if it can also make a positive change for the brand or for people or move our culture and our industry forward, and that if, if, the answer, if the question was, what is great design, I think that at least gets us to a, a starting point. It's a good cool. And, and um, I think you meant you touched on, Candice, on the, the idea around um, where, you know, there's an increasingly broad cam like palette and canvas, I suppose, that you have to work with, whether it's digital or like social media, where those things are. And DNA D sits there looking at what they would, you know, we think of as the whole communications industry you've got design advertising production pr media all these new sort of strands where do you guys think uh design and the design agency sits within this sort of ever expanding ever growing world well i'm sure that if you asked any of those particular practices they would say what we would say which is center 
I know. I was like, this is going to be trial, show our uh, true power. <laughs> the, the definition of design is ever expanding. And you can talk about, you know, Candace's background and she comes from more of a communication space. You can talk about Lisa's background from more from a pure design space. I'm also from a branding and design space. But in the last 20 years, I've seen our practice evolve and the prominence of what design can do in the marketing mix become more and more and more prominent. And we spend most of our time working with brands. And if you figure out what makes a brand unique, you can stretch it across that idea, that communication, that point of view, across things beyond just what would traditionally be known as design. And it can go across all of the different pieces of work. I mean, we've been involved and work has been selected at Dignity in many different kind of areas, whether that's PR or communications or typical design. And so what's interesting is there is no, there is no swim lane anymore. It used to be very specific, like 10, 15 years ago. We do our bit, you do your bit, let's work together. Now it's a much more open playing field. And the brand really is at the center, I think. I agree. Um, I have, Having worked in kind of like comms and advertising, absolutely, they will tell you that uh, that is at the center. But I think um, I switched out of um, comms and advertising kind of a couple of years ago to, to join JKR for the reason that... Um, regardless of what the industry says and kind of where the industry kind of sits on these kind of matters, people's attention is shifting. So their attention is shifting away from, from advertising. It's coming increasingly hard. Um, as much as I kind of love advertising and comms and I do um, to hold people's attention. And I think as you're kind of, if you think about kind of it from a, just a purely kind of human point of view, as you're flitting from kind of place to place and kind of channel to channel and platform to platform, um, the thing that's going to kind of, catch your attention and stick in your mind is really that brand and I think um for me it was it kind of becoming more and more kind of important that that brand was designed in a way that it's going to have kind of sticky bits and pieces that kind of stay in people's minds so they can kind of remember it and I think um that's why we're kind of starting to see now increasingly it's not just the brand that you're marketing is a product and then the experience around it and that becomes your marketing in and of itself so for that reason like just from a kind of human point of view I think you have to have design kind of like front and center in your brain when you're kind of um when you're kind of thinking about how to get something out into the world yeah I I also think building on what you're saying Candice is that, that then if design and brand is at the heart all of those elements that you create when you say you're rebranding or creating a new brand, you're creating distinctive assets, whether that's typography, whether that's colors, whether that's the sound, whether that's the motion and the movement that carry holistically across all of these touch points. And that's what becomes iconic and recognizable to a consumer. And I think more and more, we can't have all these different elements being disparate. So whether we all partner as a set of group of agencies and hold hands together and tackle the problems for our clients and our consumers uh, hand in hand together, or whether it is the design agency and the branding agency creating those set of distinctive assets that then can be deployed to all of the partner agencies to carry across everything in order to create that distinction, because no longer can you afford to have multiple different looks and feels going on for different channels. So um, you can afford that. Just on a monetary <laughs> And do you think, uh, I mean, it, it feels like as we come come to the end of this year, you know, it's difficult to, to talk about almost anything without thinking about COVID and what's happened for the last 12 months. So do you think that the COVID impact is going to change design's role within things? Have you noticed that it's changed how brands are thinking about uh how they engage with their consumers or is it more like it has just accelerated what you were already seeing? It's going to change a lot of things. We were talking about yeah. this earlier. It will change everything and change nothing. So in some ways, our approach to design and branding and the communications industry remains the same. Uh, clients' approaches have changed. Clients are shifting ever faster. People are moving quicker yeah, and quicker. quicker. <laughs> the way that we collaborate is different now. The, the, our outlook on talent is different. Our outlook on how and who we collaborate with and when. Uh, the reach of, of our ideas is different. But if we maintain our philosophy and what we believe in, the tools in which we use, the reach that we have, the opportunity is faster and has 
become farther reaching. And so, you know, to Lisa's point, there's many, many more opportunities for clients to connect their brands with consumers. And those areas are kind of boring right now. And so one of our missions is to make that space more exciting. And, you know, traditionally coming from a place where you would see something physically or Candace has worked on things that you'd experience in real life now, and that will change. We'll experience things in, in IRL again, but <laughs> I think we're always going to have a piece of our lives that are, are going to be this, whether that's remote working or engaging with brands and people in a non-physical way. So how do we influence those like we have done in traditional, traditional ways? And thinking about maybe on a sort of more practical level, um, I think a lot of people are quite interested in how is the, the, rem- the switch to almost complete remote working sort of worked on a day-to-day level? How has that uh, sort of come through and that changes the ways you'd looked at your uh, approach to working collaboratively either you know within the agency or when you're working with brands themselves or with external agencies on other areas please you want to do the day-to-day stuff first (laughs) i can do the day-to-day i mean there's pros and cons isn't there i think um in some ways i'll start with the pros because i think there are some really good things that's come out of this there's one uh we now i feel like we operate more as a global agency better than we ever have done before whereas might we might have been more siloed in markets now we call upon our uh, on each other in whether it's working with london or or the um sing, uh, shanghai office um and then i also certain types of tools have been really amazing like we've been using things like miro which are like whiteboarding which have co- completely replaced the kind of the old traditional boards where we're all printing out hundreds of pieces of paper and sticking it up we found collaborative collaborative tools that are starting to work a lot better that we can pop in that we can be a bit more intuitive but of course the exasperation of meetings and zooms and all the things that we hear about in the media too is is a a, a constant challenge and i think um I, th- I think what that does is counter that people feel quite as inspired there's not as much like uh like walking past each other, water cooler conversations. How do you recreate a lot of that type of uh, more kind of interactions? And I found lovely ways, like I've heard a few of my designers, they've like kept their Zoom on the whole day if they're working together, just like they're working in the same room together so that they can like just chat when they want to or, or things like that. There's been some really nice sweet stories but then there's also the ones of absolutely yeah like burnout and like relentless amounts of meetings and not starting doing your work till to the end of the day and we're really cognizant of that and hey it's a, it's a work in progress and we're going to be going well into next year working like this but i think it's also opened us up to a huge opportunity of not being able to just hire people that live in exactly the types of talent that live in the cities of where we work So now I found myself working with freelancers or potentially recruiting people that work all over the States, which I'm really excited about. That gets me to bring in a lot more unlike-minded people to be part of uh, JKR, which I'm, that's the future. And I kind of am very happy that if we go back to the office, if and when, it will be a hybrid situation. It doesn't have to be for everyone and we'll figure out that next phase. (laughs) as and when hopefully that happens it's in one way we are extremely fortunate and very lucky that we're able to continue our careers as creative people and still have impact and still do great work and still work with clients when many people are not able to I mean, we were we were able to do this quite quickly our our chinese office closed first and we learned from their experience london and new york closed on the same day and it was a herculean effort for our our teams to move their kits and get desks and get chairs and and some people do flat chairs and some people moved home to their parents and you know it was a logistical scramble to get into the world that we exist in now and that was that was an amazing effort and we've been monitoring as as lisa said how how the the, the negatives and the positives have affected and it's it's navigating this environment in some ways it makes you closer to your clients like you don't have the big office experience where you go to their office or you pitch in a big boardroom you turn out that you're you're talking to your clients in their houses with their children and their dogs, and like everyone is a, has a little more empathy, even though it's harder with a two D interaction. You get more experience and more exposure to your teams, to your collaborators, to your to your 
to your clients. And it's, uh, it's opened up maybe a better connection in a world where we're not really connected. So it's a strange, it's a strange world, but I think we're going to take a lot of uh, the positives with us. And when we get back together, we will really enjoy being back together because one thing that I know that I miss is the, the random acts of awesomeness where you just like pass a crit board and you're like, what is that? And then this person is next to that person. All of a sudden a new idea happens and that's harder to uh, manufacture. So the spontaneity of, of being together, uh, and, you know, I don't get to go to England and go to pubs anymore. So that's a bummer. I was, so it was interesting, Tosh, you were, you were talking about interacting with your clients there and how doing it in this sort of remote way has changed things. But um, one of the things I was interested in was you, all of you at the beginning, earlier in the conversation were talking about um, the where the role that design and uh, creativity can have to do good. And I was quite interested in how that, uh, how you approach those sort of social issues or um, doing good with your clients. Like, um, is it something you challenge them to be more, you know, to be more cognizant of um, like, or is it a thing that it has to come from, from them before you push those uh, agendas? I think it's both. I think that, uh, you know, Lisa's experience it currently with clients and, and Candace's experience with work that just launched. Some clients come to us with the, with the problem that they have that they want us to have a thought about. Other times we bring it to the clients that we work with and push them a little bit further. Uh, I think it's, there's no uh, typical answer. I mean, uh, maybe Candace can talk a bit about the work we did for Meltdown, which launched this year. And that was, that was a great example of, of a partnership with clients and then you know, what's happening in culture and what the right thing to do and partnering with a brand that can actually do it that makes sense for their brand. Um, I mean, I think for, we're, we're in quite a, a lucky um, position where kind of a lot of our clients are already kind of thinking about um, kind of societal good and purpose. And I think the, 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 the kind of issue we have at the moment is being a good brand and being kind of good and responsible um, feels a little bit like table stakes. And I think that's not just about um, kind of coming out and saying the right thing. It's about kind of purpose and kind of uh, societal change being kind of built into the, kind of the core of what your brand is and what it stands for and kind of like the business strategy around it as well. So I think um, you need to make sure that you kind of thought that bit through before you can kind of come out and kind of credibly say um, stuff because otherwise it doesn't feel right and it kind of, it, it jars a little bit. And I think the other thing to think about for us is as because that is the case, and because so many brands are kind of coming out and either trying to do good or say they're doing good, um, it kind of turns into noise. So you need to make sure that when you are kind of um, coming out with stuff, so for example, the, the meltdown is a, is a good one, um, you're doing it in a way that feels kind of true to what that brand stands for. So I think um, for us, kind of the, uh, the way that we kind of push that thinking is um, if BK come to us and say, we want to remove plastic toys out of our um, our meals um, we kind of think about actually okay that's a that's a brilliant idea we love that as an initiative but what's the thing that we can kind of add into that that's going to make it feel like really right and kind of from your brand so I think that kind of like <laughs> the, the thought of BK being the home of flame grilling um, and a kind of a campaign that's really kind of about the meltdown is kind of where that push comes and I think that it's about kind of like not just challenging our client to do kind of social good because I think a lot of them are um, it's really kind of pushing to do it in a way that's kind of distinctive and kind of um, branded um, for them because I think that's where you really start to kind of see the positive uptick back on the brand and obviously out in the world as well. It's interesting yeah. that a lot of the uh creative people, designers get started in their career, you know, all they want to do is work on small, interesting, designy type things. They want recognition from their peers. They want to get into a DNA annual. They want that pencil really bad and the pencil is great. And we want to have that pencil. But what's mo much more exciting is eventually in your career as you start to work with bigger brands and it's harder to do things with, with big brands because they're, you know, they're huge and there's a lot of value and the work that we do creates value for those brands. But one of the things that we really enjoy doing is working with brands of enormous scale and having a real impact on the brand and what they do in the world. And some of the, the work that we're doing with Burger King or the work that Lisa's leading in ventures, we've also been doing for some of our founding clients. And the work is, is several years old, but the ability to, to, to help clients actually do good in the world. And, you know, we were part of making Budweiser the largest buyer of wind energy in North America. And that's amazing. It's like to, to have one of the biggest brewers in the world that makes the most amount of, of beer do it in a way that's headed towards carbon neutrality worldwide by 2025. That is the impact that an actual designer with an idea 
or with the tools they have or just thinking about creativity can have with an organization of that scale is amazing. So the, the idea that it's, it's fun to do beautiful things that are interesting and cool and that have a little bit of impact, but if you can channel that energy and creativity into some of the world's largest brands, that's, that's where we find a lot of uh, excitement and success. And just, um, you, were talk- you mentioned there about some of the, like, the motivations of people as they come into the industry. And obviously, DNA, one of DNAD's sort of core pillars and missions is about um, supporting the next generation of uh, designers and creative talent. So I wanted to ask whether you felt like um, the next generation understands the importance of design? Oh, I, I, I feel like, I mean, I was doing workshops with my team the last couple of weeks more than ever. I mean, they all... They're, they all want to feel like their job has a level of purpose um, and the, the work that they're doing for the clients is going to be a small part of, a, of the greater good, more and more so. And, um, and that's really hard as well because sometimes the, the small acts or the small pieces that you do when you work on, on design and um, whether that's packaging, whether that's product, whether, that, wh- whether that's a piece of communications, it sometimes that's not like directly going to result in what the purpose is, but they are, but that's how I think as a group of creative directors, I have to bring them together to help kind of teams see that it's like, the, it's all towards the, the greater good of where that brand is going. But I think more and more the the heart of what we do really matters to, to designers. Um, I don't think they want to be working on, things that feel like they would leave any kind of bad footprint in the world. It's hard for them to justify. What do you think, Candice? You, you defected to this, this world of design. What's so attractive about it? <laughs> uh, see, I, see, I think it's, um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have a design background. So I've been on a kind of like wild mission of learning stuff about it. And I think, um, one thing I've noticed is that there's, I think there's kind of like a bit of a difference between kind of like what we consider to be kind of like traditional design and some of the stuff that's kind of coming through from the next generation who I think just intrinsically are doing design and wouldn't necessarily consider it to be so. So I think the generation who are kind of coming up are like, I mean, I'd say this, this could be a, like a list of like 20 years of people younger than me that are coming through. But <laughs> the next generation, let's just call them that, that are coming through, I think they're like born creators. They're born with phones in their hand. They're born with all of the kind of digital tools that a lot of us have had to kind of um, kind of learn and kind of like figure out for ourselves. So I think for them, kind of design feels like it's very much kind of like part and parcel of, of what they do. Like they understand on a kind of like a level that I never will how to kind of um, compose an image and put kind of stickers on it and kind of add movement to it and why that's going to be kind of, I think they, it, it feels much more kind of instinctive for them. I'm speaking in massive generalizations here, but um, I think they kind of, they, they kind of get design um, and it's part of their kind of day to day in a way that I, when I came into design, I was like, okay, I need to learn about this stuff now. So I think um, there's, it's interesting kind of where the um, next generation of designers are going to come from because I don't necessarily think it will always be from the kind of traditional places we've seen them come from um, to date. And I think it would be cool seeing some of those new voices and that kind of that new talent and that big pool of talent that we'll actually have to kind of um, pull from uh, come through. So, yeah. Are you telling me you're recruiting from TikTok now? <laughs> Look, I'm telling you I think we should be recruiting from TikTok. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's where I was going with it, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I just, I think, um, like, you look at, I mean, even, like, kids as, like, kind of young as, like, kind of seven or eight, you can put a phone in their hand and they can create something um, and they will make something that looks kind of uh, probably like an aesthetic that we'd spend hours trying to recreate in a studio. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's some interesting people coming through, I think, definitely. I think perhaps, perhaps design has moved from a craft uh, that is taught in schools about the ability to create certain things in a certain uh, you know, set of tools to more of a worldview. And so I think more people are open to the idea of design as a, as a perspective on the world. And so imagine if you were uh, in high school and middle school and you're, I didn't know design existed as a career until I was almost graduated from college, you know, and I didn't go to an art school. And I find the most interesting people that I've worked with over my career are people that were maybe not formally educated in the, in the skills of design because all of the tools can be learned, but imagine the worldview of someone who is maybe 15 or 12 right now, 
imagine if what you thought is that you can actually influence the world with your mind. You can create something that can change the way things look, they feel, the way people experience them, how you connect with people, how uh, culture, products, brands evolve and change and influence the world. And you can do it with your mind where perhaps that was before with, you know, a drafting tool or illustrator or a particular set of skills that were very striated in an industry where you're either this specialist or that specialist. I think we're moving into a space where, of course, we're going to need people that can, that are brilliant at making certain things and have abilities and skills in certain areas, but maybe it's more of a worldview where you can approach things from a perspective of how your creativity can, can change from very small things that are that are just making things look and feel a little better to big giant things that are going to change people and culture. Yeah, I think I think that's very true. And I well, I'm conscious that we're running slightly out of time here, so I wanted to end with just a couple of questions, sort of looking forward into 2021. So I'm interested in uh, what sort of trends or themes um, you sort of can imagine emerging. They're maybe emerging now, and you think will grow, or that you're predicting will uh, be significant and we'll be talking about them next year? We've obviously seen different eras in terms of like you've got your, your sort of digital sans serif kind of rebrands and then perhaps one of the brands that I worked on in a past life, Chobani, then influenced the whole kind of stream of like nostalgia and warmth and, and, and serif typefaces and, and colours and things like that. And then I think we've there's been a bit of a, a nasty trap and I don't really want to dwell on any negatives of like uh, a lot of like mimicking um, and what I think has been coined as blanding where people are just moving incredibly fast. Things are very digital, very things uh, people aren't taking the time to really peel back the onion layers of like, what is the idea behind this brand? How do we bring it to life in a unique, distinct way that's true to that brand? And there's a lot of, a lot of churn like that happening. So I, I hope for next year that there'll be more breakthrough things happening, more distinction, more different things. So it doesn't feel like it's a trend of all the same stuff but that's happening. That there's, there's more of a, uh, uh, a, a more kind of uh, creativity kind of dispersing in more kind of interesting ways than things that we feel like we've all seen before. Mm. Yeah, That's say, what I say, hope say, next year. <laughs> outside of our cool fashion trends where we're going to follow Lisa, I think down with trends, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't be following these trends. And I think that has been a, a an issue of our industry and an issue of the industry at large as the ability to see everything all at once has come ever ever faster. And so I would I would suggest and implore people to, you know, once we're allowed to leave our 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 homes, seek out inspiration beyond typical, go find new things, peel back the onion, think what the interesting ideas are. And if you're doing really, really great work, and I'd love to see it in 21, because I think if you go back to like what, uh 1919, there was a flourish of creativity after that in the tw- in the 20s. We've been in the pandemic that's a you know a hundred years uh, since I believe there will be a flourish of creativity and that people will come out with new and interesting and exciting things and different types of people are going to get together. And I don't know that there will be trends that they'll follow. I think we'll be surprised and there will be excellent creativity that comes out. Uh, at least that's what I hope. And please don't make this like a soundbite, but I genuinely do think that trend predicting is for mugs. So <laughs> one of the reasons why is I was, I can't remember what, what started off, but I was looking at, I ended up looking at a load of trend reports from the beginning of the year. And I was like, what an absolute waste of time that was for everyone who wrote all of it. They were brilliant, well-researched, loads of detail, loads of stuff that could have happened. And then this unexpected big kind of pandemic hits and everything kind of goes out the, goes out the water. So um, I, te- I tend to agree. I think there's going to be, there's been a lot of people who've been kind of like frustrated in this period. And I think once we kind of all kind of come back out into 2021, good things will happen, but Lord knows what they'll look like at this stage. I love the nomenclature of trend reports. Like they make them up with like ridiculous names for things. I think that's really great. <laughs> great. <laughs> a lot of the stuff that we do whether we're creating new brands or working with you know legacy brands it's like try to find something that's timeless that is is relevant to that brand or you can create something that's going to exist if a brand wants to exist for the next 40 years and you've just made it today 
And then how do you make it relevant to the context, to the consumers, to humanity, to culture? Because relevance is ephemeral and it will change. But core ideas and you know equities and timeless truths will always proceed. And so as our technology changes and as our world changes, the timeless truths, I think, will be the things that we should think about. And then, of course, we'll talk to the TikTok kids that, that Candace is going to bring in and they'll make it relevant. Which is great. <laughs> so basically, uh, timeless truths and uh, jump seats, that's our answer. <laughs> well, I think on that note, not to sound too top gear, uh, we'll end it there. Thank you very much, Candice, Lisa and Tosh. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you very much.